I'm your host, Andy Creevel. I'm also the global head coach of the data school, and I'm being attacked by a dog at the moment. Um, and I created this podcast to introduce you to influential people in the world of data. Today, I'm talking with Francois Agenstadt. I first met Francois in 2010 when he was just this little low, lowly product manager guy at Tableau. Uh, but he's gotten a bit more influential since then, is now the chief product officer at Tableau. And Matt Francis likes to call them the CP3O, something like, or C3PO. Uh, but Francois is one of the most engaging speakers I've ever heard, and I better not tell him who's better. We're going to talk about his speaking skills, how we develop those, evangelism, mentoring, and of course, a bit about our dog since Maggie's here in my lap. So welcome, Francois. Hey, Andy. So great to be here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Uh, I love so it. It makes me so happy. <laughs> Quick question. Can we start so, talking about dogs first, actually? Start to, Tell we, us we about Maggie. start with dogs. Yeah. So you want this is Maggie. Maggie's a black lab. She's two years old. And she, um, I was telling Francois before, before we started that Maggie eats around 5 to 5.30, but about 3 o'clock, she starts begging for dinner. And well, you know, they have their rituals, right? And we all have rituals. <laughs> and this is Bachi right here. Yeah. Bachi is a eight-and-a-half-year-old French bulldog, oh, and he has to be with me at all times. <laughs> and he snores all day. He farts a little bit, so I have the air purifier going most of the day. <laughs> and he's generally just a lump, one big potato lump. Yeah. What's his, what's his favorite food? Uh, he loves just food. Just food. If it's Anything. food, he will right. eat it. Yeah. Uh, but, Anything uh, edible. Exactly. Sweet potato fries is uh, his current favorite. Oh. And then, okay. uh, you know, with his meal... If I just put food in his bowl, he won't eat it. I have to add some treats. Then he has to go look at it and make sure they're the right treats. So we have to switch it around because he gets bored yeah. after two days. Of so he trained you basically. Day. Basically, yes. Yeah. He's the real. He's the real boss of the family, right, Bob? <laughs> yeah, Mag Maggie's a big fan of uh, vegetables, so um, she doesn't get she dog. doesn't get any people food except for vegetables. So um, Eva likes to give her broccoli, but then she complains about the broccoli farts. Um, but uh, if she's, she doesn't tend to drink enough water, we don't think, so she gets cucumbers a lot to try to hydrate her. Um, and she likes, she had a carrot today. Oh, see, she just raised her ears when I oh, said yeah. carrot. Yeah. Um, so, but, but she's Labrador, so she will eat until she pukes if you let her. So, um, and her favorite game, her favorite game is fetch. And I started oh, tracking. Nice. So for every walk that I do with her, I track the number of poops she's taken, and the number of <laughs> balls that, she, <laughs> and the number of balls that she found. So she she found nineteen balls in July. So we have wow. this gigantic basket of of balls, and they're all we've never paid for one of them. Um, so. <laughs> And last well, that'll, night, that'll make a great visualization. You should put that, you know, in the newspaper, the characteristics of our dogs. I think it's already on Tableau Public. Oh, well, there you go. Of course. <laughs> I would expect no less from you. <laughs> uh, but they, uh, um, now I lost my train of thought. Last night, I took her for a walk and it was pitch blackout. And we're in this field nearby and you can't see anything. So I have a head torch on. And all I see is, head, uh, all I see is eyeballs when I when I uh, turn the lights on, it's all foxes. So she just takes off for the foxes. Uh, oh, no. we, have, we have tons and tons of foxes around here. Um, so she's running through uh, all of the woods and all this is so funny. But anyway, I end up getting her away from the foxes and we go walk for a while. And we're coming back down to kind of where we started. And there's this, there's this group of trees in the middle of the park. And we're kind of walking through, we always walk through there. All of a sudden she takes off to the right comes back instantly with a ball. It must've been 30, 40 yards away. She smells it, runs over and brings it back. It's unbelievable. So Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of jealous of her senses. Well, I don't know if I'd want her sense of smell actually. Now, uh, that would be kind of distracting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, we, we digress. Um, maybe I'll go backwards in my questions then and we'll talk about public speaking last. Um, do you celebrate Thanksgiving as a Canadian? Uh, you know, I celebrate Friendsgiving. 
that oh. we get together as friends and we okay. just hang out, eat and drink. Okay. So, you, so you, you kind of celebrate it the same way. Exactly. Yeah, Cause, you, cause everybody takes but the, the real question off, is, anyway. yeah. Do I celebrate Thanksgiving in October, the proper time to celebrate Thanksgiving? Oh, is that when Canadian Thanksgiving is? That's when Canadian Thanksgiving right. is because it's colder <laughs> up North. And so the harvest is earlier. Yeah. yeah. And that, and you have your little break to celebrate yeah. harvest. Okay, I, I I knew there was Canadian Thanksgiving, but I but I didn't know when. Um, what's something you're thankful for? Uh, well, I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for the dog, uh, and I'm actually thankful, uh, quite frankly, um, for the the community that we built around you know this this company and this product that we built. Because, yeah. you know, every single day, like life, life can be hard, can be frustrating, uh, but you've got these sources of inspiration around you. And I just get this energy and so yeah. I'm thankful yeah. for all of, all of you uh, that are providing amazing, amazing mm -hmm. energy every day. Yeah. Well, neither of us would have our jobs without the community. So Correct. Yeah. So thankful uh, product, for that. Who knows what type of it would be like as a product without, uh, you know, with, without the community or data fam. Um, okay. You now kind of split your time between New York and Seattle, right? I do. Okay. Which do you prefer? If uh, you can only I pick one. I prefer New York. Really? I prefer New York. Oh, oh yeah. My wife prefers Seattle. I hate New but York. But in New York, I love, I love it. The energy, the diversity, oh. the vibrancy. It's amazing. Yeah. I guess uh, for me, it's just too noisy. Well, you know, this, the thing is that in New York, there's just everything to do, yet yeah. at the same time, you can do nothing at all. Yeah, yeah. And I just find that just invigorating. When I come here to Seattle, we have a beautiful house, amazing outdoors, uh, but we end up just kind of being chill. <laughs> and I just feel alive in New York. Yeah. So yeah. I get energized. My wife actually kind of yeah. ends up being <laughs> so a little to bit. So go back the other way to even it back out. Exactly. Right? So, so about exactly. when you're over, about like Missouri is when you actually cross paths. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Emotionally. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in general, I just love big cities. You know, if, yeah. I, if I will travel, you know, Japan, London, Paris, they just, they get me so energized. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I wish New York had, uh, London and New York are very similar. Obviously, New York's a lot bigger, but both very, very diverse cities. But one of the things that London has is parks, lots and lots of great parks, big parks, small parks, little corner parks, everything. But you can't get, you don't have that in New York. And that's one of the things I miss when I'm there. Except well, for- you do. You just have to know where they are. So where our home is in New York, we have uh, one park half a block away. Right. Then you walk two more blocks and there's another park there. And okay. then you walk another three blocks and there's another park there. It's actually, there's quite a bit. You just have to discover it in the neighborhoods. Yeah. I, maybe and it's because I've only found is in Manhattan as it's well. the neighborhoods. Yeah. Yeah. It's the yeah. neighborhoods. That, right. That's right. what makes all the difference. Okay. Well, I take that back then. I, I apologize for just uh, for saying bad things about your favorite city. C come over to, to New York. We will, I will make you discover the city. We'll go have ice cream together. Cause I know love how much it. you love ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> People probably that are, are listening probably don't really know my love of ice cream. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty bad. I, pro people probably don't know I can't make ice cream yeah. <laughs> or have no creativity in my ice cream making. I'll, I'll have to tweet out that picture again at some point. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, what are some of your hobbies that you do outside of, you know, everybody, I know you, everybody knows you for being this, you know, famous uh, person at Tableau. What are your, what do you like to do outside of work? Uh, well, so I work out, I go boxing uh, mm. and that is my, stress release uh because you know it's just you and the bag and you just let it all out for an hour well. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and you feel so relaxed afterwards you can't lose either um, <laughs> you can't lose <laughs> unless the bag hits you back yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um so that's uh, definitely a, a big hobby of mine just uh, exercising being healthy um i've gotten into you know two kinds of hobbies obviously i love food i love discovering new restaurants new things um, mm -hmm. But I love watches. Uh, I've oh, fallen in love with watches. I've always had uh, this affinity for watches when I was a kid. Uh, my dad would get us a swatch every year when we went to France. Oh. To visit Did family. you have a little guard on top too to keep it from? Of getting course, yeah. of course. 
Um, and, and but for some reason, I have this connection to watches, and it just I love it. Um, and so that has become a little bit of a of a daily thing of which watch do I put on, and it, there's this ritual that's tied to it. Today, it's a yeah. the moon swatch, which oh. is the swatch. And Are they all swatches Black that you have? What's that? Are, are they all swatch watches? No, I, oh, okay. I branched out quite a bit, but I have everything from, you know, high end expensive to, you know, Casio's, um, right, right. it's just fun. And then yeah. sneakers is my other thing. So I yeah. kind of became through the pandemic, I became a little bit more of a sneaker head. Yeah. Uh, I had to wear nothing shoes else to do, or, well, I had nothing else to do, but I, again, it's to me, there's these rituals. And I had a ritual that when I put on shoes and I went to the office, which was downstairs in the basement where I'm right now, uh, that meant I was going to work. And so I just, you know, ended up getting excited about putting on new shoes to go to the office, again, just walking down the hallway yeah. uh, to the basement. Yeah. You try to keep it in. I guess it, that's a good idea. It keeps it kind of as normal as possible, you know, to, to exactly. you know. Um, did you live in New York before the pandemic as well? So was that part of the reason? Uh, well, that... yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we were part-time in New York two years before the pandemic. Um, okay. But we started going to New York before that. Uh, my wife and I have no kids, uh, right. just a dog. And so we're like, hey, let's just go to New York for a couple days. She loves the theater. I love restaurants. Uh, and we started going every quarter. And we would go, there's always kind of like a really busy weekend, but we'd stay in these tiny little New York hotels. Yeah. We were on top of each other and we would get mad. And by the end of the three or four days, we're like, okay, I can't see you anymore. I don't want right. to be near you. Uh, and that's what gave us the inspiration saying, well, what if we had our own crash pad? Right. And that right. kind of became that yeah. connection. Oh, that's great. What about... You're, okay, so you, so you said boxing. Um, we had in the data school, I think he's still, I think he's in maybe his P3 or his P4 now, third or fourth placement. He was amateur boxing champion in the UK. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so That's we, amazing. Uh, we, we try to not make him mad. Um, and Lorna, when Smart. she was, when Lorna was young, she was a Taekwondo champion as well, a youth Taekwondo champion. So I keep trying to poke her to get her to try to kick me. Uh, Cause I don't, I don't think she has it anymore. I don't think she, I don't think she can do it. So <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna, let's I'm gonna, go, uh, let's go and tempt her. I, I want to, yeah. I want to start a new uh, contest. Who can kick Andy first? I wonder if we could make that a fundraiser at TC. Uh, we could, or we could just make it a celebration. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like that as much. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a long, long, long line. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's let's get back to it here. Public speaking. Ever yes. since I've known you, you've been a fantastic public speaker, and you get better all the time, Thank you. right? And that's just part of doing something a lot. You just naturally get better at it. Where did you start? Uh, where did I start? Um, you know, I started actually, I, I did theater classes when I was in high school and okay. elementary school. Um, but that I but I had no love for theater, just to be clear. Uh, but it was just a thing I, I did and I was okay right. with it. Um, and my uh, after I graduated from university, my first startup uh, that I worked at, you know, I was a coder. I was writing code, but mm -hmm. I was terrible at my code. My code was the worst. But I was really good at telling people what my code was supposed to do. Ah, right. uh, and that's when I started to, I don't want to say pitch, but like explain the story of my right. code and explain the opportunity in front of it. And I got this, this excitement because people reacted positively to it, but I was not mm. a good speaker. Part of it was I had a thick accent back then. Right. I, uh, I know most people know my name, Francois, but uh, <laughs> I used to have a big accent and I learned to uh, get rid of it. Yeah. And now I can speak more with an American accent. Um, but uh, when I moved to Microsoft uh, in uh, 2000, uh, that's when I started to really do public speaking. I did demos and demos was my, um, my conduit to doing speeches. Uh, I love the art of a demo. I love a great demo. 
Um, they're so impactful. They're so mm -hmm. exciting. Uh, but I started doing demos for Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer and Jeff Frakes and some of these top executives. And I just got really comfortable, but I also got to see them. Whether they're a good public speaker or not, just the craft of developing the story, how mm. you think about the messages you want to deliver, the impact you want to have, what you highlight and what you don't, just got me excited. And I took a lot of classes um, and I had the privilege of you know, having the company give us public speaking classes. Yeah, yeah. And um, there was this one, so I've, I've had a lot of you know, public speaking teachers, but there was this one... Uh, speaker that I think was the most impactful to me. Uh, and his, uh, his name is uh, Jerry Weissman. Uh, he's got a couple books. He was a broadcaster and started uh, helping uh, technology executives who are terrible at public speaking, mm -hmm. uh, how to present to win. And whether you're doing a uh, you know, pitch deck or a conference or going on a broadcast, there was a way of telling the story. And that, he and his method actually became one of the most impactful things for me and something I still practice to this day. Yeah. Have you ever worked with Montana and Von Fliss? I have. Yeah, I, I have as well. She's, if Montana's anybody's looking fantastic. for a speaking coach, she's unbelievable. So, so, so good. Yeah. I did. I didn't know if she was part of the, you know, the, the people you learned from because um, I did. I, I remember when, when I spoke at the Tableau, company uh, kickoff, whatever it was. It wasn't the sales kick. It was when the whole company was there. I think that was in 2010. Um, I was invited to come speak when I was working at Coca-Cola and she helped me back then as well. And then I worked with her again another time. So um, yeah, re really great coach if anybody's looking for a, for a great speaking coach. So that's kind of how She's you learn. How, how do you? That's how I learned. Yeah. Uh, but it's also you know, you have to seek the feedbacks. So I right. hate rehearsals. I hate practice. And I hate going through the journey, but I need that feedback along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the coaches, to me, like, it, 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 it kind of sucks because you're, you're looking for critique. And yeah. so it doesn't matter how good you are. You want that critique. And so every time you just feel, I don't want to say deflated, but you feel like, oh my God, I'm terrible at this. Because yeah. you get, you're getting more input. And then they just kind of sink in a little bit more and you improve and you improve and you improve. And for a Tableau conference, Zach Woodall was, was telling me to ask you about how you prepare for a Tableau conference. How do you do that? Because your, your keynotes are pretty <laughs> epic. And, and I've been told, I think Thank Eva you. told me this, that you don't use notes. So, or no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Eva. It was um, Mark Nelson told me that. Uh, cause he was doing a rehearsal with you or something. And, you know, he's, he's a bit more regimented. I don't know what the word to use is, but he's a bit more um, scripted, I guess, with his keynotes. And then he said, he sees you go up there and there's nothing. And he's like, what the heck? You know? <laughs> he's embarrassing me. <laughs> I make it up as I go along. Um, well, so there's, there's two parts of uh, keynote preparations. There's mine. And then there's the coaching I do to others. Okay. And uh, I will apologize to all of the speak people that I've coached because uh, I'm ruthless. I'm a pain. I brought people to tears. Uh, people want to quit. And then they come out of it really excited. So let me just kind well, of you've split got high those two. I have ex high expectations, but it's, it's not about me. It's about yeah. the audience. It's about all of you. It's about the people you're trying to present to. Mm. And so uh, part of the, the Jerry Weissman coaching, um, and, I, and I still use it to this day, is the idea of thinking about the Wi-Fi. And the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi, I know, not the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi, <laughs> uh, which stands for what's in it for you and you being the audience. And many times presenters want to present their content. They want to present mm. you know, the thing they built or the thing that matters to them. But the reality is the audience doesn't care about me. They care about themselves. Yeah. And so you really have to think about your audience and what do they care about and what's the message they should hear and why they should care. And when you flip that perspective, all of a sudden the presentation becomes more engaging because you care about mm -hmm. it. And, and so this little technique of how you define the story uh, I think is actually really effective because you give, you have empathy, 
but you also relate more with the audience. And if you make it more of a story, I guess it's easier to remember as well, probably, right? Uh, it is, but again, you've created that connection with your audience and yeah. that's, that's a lot easier. Um, yeah. But I'll say that uh, part of what you've probably heard of uh, my keynote rehearsal is, um, yes, I have no notes, um, but I spend months working through the pitch. And yeah, some of the ways I do it is I, you know, talk to customers and, you know, they ask for a roadmap or they ask for a strategy and I just start riffing through the pitch. And out of everything I say, 90% of it is crap. Even though people might think it's great, 90% of it is crap. And I'm trying to find that 10% nugget in that delivery that I can take back. And then I go at it again and I keep that 10%, but the rest of it is kind of crap, but there's one more piece that I bring in. And I just do that continuously over time. And then I just have those good bits that I start stitching together and I create the idea. Uh, but sometimes I start with an idea for what I want to deliver and it doesn't land. So I try a different approach and it doesn't land. And I try again and I try again. Right. Right. And eventually I find the right pieces that I want to bring in. Who do you rehearse with that gives you that feedback that 90% is crap and this is the 10% you should keep? Because really it's not so, you. Right? You think it's all good when you first create it, right? Well, uh, Why would sure. you create it otherwise, right? I, I know it's directionally uh, in the right place, but maybe I'm not delivering it quite right. Maybe I haven't found the essence yeah. of the story. Yeah. So uh, I do two things. One is I just talk to customers. I think about my audience. Okay. And so I actually have not customer panels, uh, but I'll do many, many di different customer calls where I try it out. Um, okay. The other thing we do is uh, in the office, and now that we're virtual, it's kind of a virtual office, but in the office, we'll actually bring about 10 to 20 different people from across the company and we'll rehearse and we'll try it out. And maybe the slides aren't there yet, or, you know, we're not polished, but we'll get different pieces of feedback. And so we'll have people from marketing and ops and sales mm -hmm. and development who've never heard the story and they give uh, feedback along the way. Now, unfortunately, some of them will say, oh, that was amazing, you can deliver that. I'm like, no, 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 90% <laughs> of it is crap, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so you want that diversity of feedback to know how to get there. Yeah. Um, and I find that super helpful. The people that are there are going to know that you're at a certain level within the organization though. So how do you, how do you get them to give you that really, you know, kind of like you give people harsh feedback. You want the harsh feedback, I assume, because you want to, you want to make it great. Right. So how do you, how do you get that out of them? Because they could be in, Intimidate is not the right word, but maybe, you know, people are afraid to say things to people that are high up in organizations. Well, part of that is culture, right? That you want a culture that's open and transparent. Yeah. And part of it is actually asking and soliciting feedback. Like we're here to know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you think is mm -hmm. missing. And so depending on the audience and who's there, uh, sometimes there's a little bit of trust. So, you know, people will be more comfortable sharing. Uh, but other times you can say, look, if you don't want to share it publicly, can you send me an email with what you liked and what you didn't like mm. or those kinds of things? So you give it a little bit of a structure, but you're soliciting feedback. You're seeking it and you're open about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, sometimes if you just go do a presentation, you know, without that open invitation, yeah, you won't get that reaction that you want. So just by being open and transparent, it's good. The other thing is that some of the people in the room, because you have that trust, you're, you're modeling what you're looking for. So, you know, I've done a session with uh, a lot of people and there was like an, um, uh, Andy Cotgrave in there and he gave me some pretty harsh feedback. Yeah. And the way I took it, I wasn't taking it personally. I was like, oh yeah, that's great. Or was it because of this or because of that? And I was looking to learn. Mm. And they, this actually, you know, models the behavior that you want and it gets people more comfortable because I don't take it personally. Yeah. That's the art of feedback as well. You need to Correct. give feedback to people in a way that they know it's not about them. It's about the piece of work that they did. So at the data school, if somebody asked me to review the visualization, I give them pretty harsh feedback because I've got high expectations, but the feedback's never about them. It's about the work that they created because I know they can do better. 
that's, that's right. something that, again, has to be built up within the culture of an organization that feedback is good, right? And it's a tough thing here in the UK because when you ask people to give feedback to each other, they don't really want to do it because culturally they don't like being kind of conf confrontational like that. So maybe me being an American within a British company has helped people become, you know, more, more open about those things. So it's, it's still something we struggle with. Do you have any, any tips for how we can break those things down so we can get people to give each other honest, it's not, it's, you know, maybe it's critical, but it's honest feedback. You know, it's, it's, you know, you were the project lead this week. I think you could have done this better. This didn't work. The next project well, manager I, shouldn't do that. So how, what's a good way for people to do that without feeling really, um, I don't know, people just get nervous about it, I guess, giving that kind of feedback. I, I think um, a little bit of it is a mindset. One is people have to want to learn and improve. And, you know, this continuous improvement mindset, I think is important. So, you know, you have to want the feedback first and foremost. And second is feedback doesn't have to be harsh. Feedback can be constructive, uh, can be creative. And so it's helping your audience see it in a different way or see the things that maybe they had the blind spots to. Um, and then again, not everybody can take or give feedback in the same way. So I find sometimes just structuring it and enabling uh, a process to give feedback is useful. So just, you know, having three or four questions, you know, what's the best part? Uh, what do you think uh, we should change? Or what didn't you like? Uh, what other ideas do you have? Because feedback is also other creative ideas to bring that in. And I think when you add it in that perspective, I look at it as constructive to move forward. So even though, you know, when I coach other people on demo delivery or, or those sections, it may sound harsh, but really what I'm trying to do is get the essence out of it and really get people to get to the root core of what they want to deliver, as opposed to, you know, I can critique their delivery. I always say that, yeah, that's the last thing we're going to do. Or I can critique your slides. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Do you have a core story? Do you have a theme? Do you know why you're presenting? And if you know those things, the rest becomes right, the, the polish that you put around them. One of the things we talk about as coaches that, that we've noticed recently is that either when we're giving feedback or people are giving feedback to each other is when you give people positive feedback, it tends to be more general. You presented well you designed a nice dashboard, but when you give them critical feedback, it's very specific and direct. And we're trying to learn how can we give more explicit and direct feedback for things people are doing well as well. Do, do you notice that same sort of behavior? Absolutely. Uh, and and it's, I think it's in life. Like we remember some of those tough moments in life more than some of the positive mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. Uh, because you, you have more of a reaction to it. Uh, but hey, if it sounds good, yeah, it sounded good. Great. Yeah. But what are those moments? The, the moments to remember is a, a really good thing to think about. Yeah. I remember a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago now, um, you and I, I had asked you to have a, have a call with me to talk about like uh, basically my job. Um, yeah, I had moved into this new role uh, as global head coach and I really had no idea what I was supposed to be doing other than I thought it was you know, some type of evangelism. I didn't really know what that meant. I had a concept in my head, you know, it's kind of like, I guess, sort of like marketing, you know, kind of thing. Can you tell people what you think evangelism is? I get, and it's more like, you know, even though the data school is people, we kind of are a product more or less, right? So what's right. your take on sort of, how would you define product evangelism? Um. So product evangelism to me is really about um, communicating and engaging. At the end of the day, you're trying to create. So if you go back in time and what is an evangelist, right? You think of that more in terms of religious contests, uh, contexts, and you're trying to spread a religion, right? You're trying to spread a mindset out there. Uh, what we're trying to do in product evangelism is really um, 
share our point of view into the world and get people excited and engaging on the conversation, uh, engaging on spreading the love or spreading the ideas in unique and different ways. Uh, but it's about getting your point of view out there. And I say your point of view, you know, you, at the end of the day, when you're evangelizing something, you're trying to get your something out there to the widest possible audiences. Mm -hmm. And how do you get there? How do you engage them where they are and um, create a position for yourself? And that position becomes really important because you have to have a meaning. You have to have something that you're evangelizing and a point of view. Uh, and for me, on the product side, the most influential product evangelist is Guy Kawasaki. He was the first evangelist at Apple way, 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 way back in the day. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty amazing how he was engaging. He was trying to get developers to build on Mac. And Mac had no market share compared to Windows. <laughs> uh, and so how do you get them excited? How do you get them engaged? Um, and I think about that all the time, mm -hmm. not just in terms of... I'm marketing. I want to engage and communicate and build kind of it's this point of view out there. Uh, and I think that's really, really important in the mm -hmm. jobs we do. Um, but I think it's actually it's, it's not a negative. Evangelism is actually a really positive thing mm -hmm. if you have those positive intents. Yeah. It's about your beliefs, right? Like you said, a preacher, you know, it's if you Correct. believe in the product, you can easily evangelize about the product uh, or it makes it it makes it easier to evangelize about, about the product. Yeah. That right. guy Kawasaki. And you can evangelize on a lot of different things, right? Just yeah. to be clear. Yeah. Right. I do product evangelism. If right. you think about it and when I'm out there, but you can be an evangelist for anything, your yeah. cause, your mission, your nonprofit, yeah. your public policies, right? You have to just spread them out there. Yeah. Yeah. I see Seth Cochran is, is watching and, you know, he's an evangelist for uh, Operation Fistula, right? It's something he's very passionate about and he evangelizes about that to try to get people engaged. And so he's another, another really good example of that. By the way, that Guy Kawasaki book that you recommended that I read, it took me months to find a copy because it's not in print. Oh, anymore. really? It's not in print. <laughs> and they, I, Does that mean I'm old or <laughs> it's just really popular? It means, well, it's, it's limited supply. So I think it's like supply and demand now, you know, classic <laughs> supply and demand. So it was quite expensive to get as a paper used paperback. So, um, and well, I have, you should have I, let I, me I know. Just kind of, I would have gladly sent it to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, now you tell me, um, but I, I, I haven't read much of it yet, but the person that read it before me did underline stuff. So that's a, <laughs> It's like the crib notes version. So I should just read. That means I have to put a lot of trust in that person, though, if I'm going to absolutely, know, hopefully, you know, I can't figure out who that person is. Or then maybe I could, you know, think, think about is, is their opinion really valid? Do they know what they're doing? Um, let's talk a bit about product management. What What is it? I know you've come into the data school and talked to us about, you know, basically you've got a set of features. You need to decide what to deliver. That's essentially product management, right? Um, and, uh, I mean, you know, you, you, but well, you start with a set of features, bug fixes, whatever that have to be done. And then as product managers, you decide how those fit in with the development of the product. Is that right? Well, I'll say it slightly differently, which is product managers need to understand the what and the why mm -hmm. in its simplest term. Okay. So I, I actually, and I start even before that is what are the problems that customers have that you can solve? And I always think that product managers need to fall in love with the customer problem, not fall in love with the solution, which is sometimes the fallacy of when you just think about these are the features they got to deliver. They have to deeply understand those customer problems, how okay. those uh, customers are trying to solve those today, uh, what would it mean if we solved it in the right way? And then really thinking through then uh, the what. Okay, so that's the core problem. It's an important problem. Solving it means X, Y, and Z. And um, you know, this, these are the trade-offs I would make to get there. And so mm -hmm. I think of that product manager as you know, understanding deeply their customers, understanding deeply the product that solves those needs, uh, understanding deeply how things get done as well, right? The mechanisms to get things out there. 
Uh, and then lastly, as I'd say that a product manager is a ruthless prioritizer. And ruthless uh, is, is a kind of a, a strong term to use, but you know, at the end of the day, knowing what to build, uh, it's, it's an art, uh, but really the craft is knowing what not to build. That's strategy. What do you say no to? It's not that you wanna say no all the time, it's that you know what you're saying yes to, and those are the right things to work on. Yeah. That doesn't mean you always get it right, but when you are really focused on that problem and you understand which problems are more important than others, hopefully you're making the right calls and building the right things. Mm -hmm. Seth Cochran was asking on the chat what the book is. It's called Selling the Dream, Seth. And good luck finding a copy. Maybe you can have it after I finish mine. Um, yeah, I, I meant and to Seth, ask you. Any of the guidebooks are really good, just to be clear. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you go back to the old, old books, it's a great history lesson, but it kind of gives you the mindset. Yeah. He's yeah. written lots of books and had lots of speeches since then. I think he's, he's great. I meant to ask you one thing about public speaking that I, that I forgot to ask a minute ago. How do you get rid of the ums and the ahs and the, the filler words? Uh, lots and lots. If there was a magic bullet for that, then people would pay a lot of money for it, right? But it, it comes to practice, basically? A lot of it comes to practice. Uh, some of it is pausing. We try to go so fast. Mm. Pausing helps, as I'm doing right now. <laughs> and when you are uh, presenting in a... Uh, in a larger scale setting, movement helps. But pausing and movement can really get you to your next thought. Uh, because when you think about your ums and your ahs, that's really where you're either trying to fill that dead space or you're thinking. You're going back into the register and saying, what's my next thing I want to say? Pause, move on to next beat. When you say moving, you mean physically moving, right? On stage? Or right now I'm moving okay. to my next beat. Okay, right, gotcha. And when gotcha. you're on stage, I'm very intentional in my movements. I walk, I dance. pause, I dance, I look <laughs> in an area of the audience, I shift perspective to emphasize a word. Those are the things I really think about. Okay, great. I want to get to some fun questions now. We, we've, we've talked enough about work stuff. Let's get to some fun things. Who's been the most influential person in your life? And you can't say your wife. Andy Kriebel. Oh, you're such a liar. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were, you were going to say you can't say me. Um, you know, the, the most influential person in my life, I want to say... I'm actually going to say Rupert Bonham Carter. And uh, he will not know that I've actually said his name uh, unless he's, we're ta we tag him on, on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, but Rupert, I met him when I joined Cognos back in, mm -hmm. I think it was 1998. And he was managing strategic alliances and he was looking at Microsoft and IBM and all these folks. And the thing uh, about Rupert was that he didn't really see the world in the same way as everybody else. Uh, he just saw opportunities. He saw creativity. And, you know, he kind of taught me a little bit of a little bit of marketing, a little bit of sales, a little bit of product. Uh, and if I go back in time, I think the time that I spent working with Rupert, I was doing tech. I joined his team afterwards to do technical alliances. I think that actually shaped my career the most mm -hmm. of any other leader I've worked with uh, since. Mm. From a public speaking perspective, how influential was Christian Chabot? Uh, Christian was somebody I aspired to be like. He, I mean, he was one of the best in the world. You, know, yeah. you got Steve Jobs, you got Christian Chabot, like they are in that same caliber. He was the person I thought was better than you, by the way. Well, by by long shot, there's like <laughs> 50 other people that are way better than me. <laughs> that I've heard, <laughs> heard myself. 
I actually think uh, some politicians are actually really, really good too. Like JFK, if you go watch his yeah. old speeches, or he's amazing. Uh, but um, Chabot would spend hundreds of hours preparing his speeches, agonizing over the words, agonizing over everything. It was he, he spent so much time on it, and it showed. Um, and I, I still have some of his deliveries in my head when I'm preparing. Um, but I actually think from, from a public speaking standpoint, I go back to Jerry Weissman as somebody who has actually changed how I present and has stayed with me right, for such a long time. I mean, I've had some great speakers, but for whatever reason, I keep going back to Jerry's techniques. Mm -hmm. There's a question in the chat. How do you prioritize the content for your talk? So let's say, I think this uh, Dr. Nicholas Heck Grossick only has 10 minutes for his talk. How do you prioritize what to talk about? Or does somebody do that for you? Uh, no, I do <laughs> it myself. Uh, but, uh, but I start with the audience. I, what does the audience need to take away from this in whatever period of time I have? Not what I have to give. Okay, so if the audience is looking for inspiration or they want motivation or they need to take this action, I work backwards from there and then think about my ingredients mm -hmm. and what I could do. So think of your baking. Uh, somebody says, please make a cake. Great, here are my ingredients. And I can create whatever cake I want. It could be a tart, it could be whatever. Um, but you have to think about those things. And uh, But the working backwards process is what I use all the time, even in product mm -hmm. management. I don't think about what features I wanna build. I work backwards from the customer problem yeah, yeah. to the solution. Okay, great. I really like this question. Let's see what you can do with it. What is your biggest regret personally? And if you could go back and change it, what would you do? Oy vey, <laughs> biggest regret personally. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a really personal thing, but you know, some kind of regret that you have, maybe you still think about it and you wish you could go back and change it. Um. I have a lot of, uh, you know, I don't think of them as regrets, but I, I think about, again, I'm a big fan of continuous learning. So, yeah. you know, if I knew then what I know now, I would have yeah. made these different things. Uh, I have that all the time for work. I have so many work things that I could <laughs> just go back. And it's not that they were bad. It's that now that I know, I would have done these things even better. Right. Uh, I mean, personally, I think sometimes I'm a little bit impulsive, I will say uh especially like when it watches. comes to things like, like buying watches or sneakers um i think uh probably the biggest personal uh, bad decision we did is the first house that my wife and i bought together uh, was this incredible house uh super modern it was basically the house that you should get 20 years from now right but i got a little bit arrogant and a little bit uh, bullish about the future and what we would build. And yeah. I think we, we just overbought, we overspent, we bought a place that was way too big for our needs, uh, way too everything. And what we realized for that moment was not that uh, our, our eyes were bigger than our stomachs, but more that the lifestyle, the things you had to put into it didn't match what we really wanted to do. I don't mm -hmm. want to spend all my time cleaning and furnishing and doing all these things and having, right. you know, 10 rooms you weren't used. So now I, we actually got it more minimal and we're really focusing on the things yeah. we love and go from there. Oh, that's great. That's great. What's the last thing that made you cry? <laughs> last thing that made me cry. <laughs> I think I rewatched E.T. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, that's just sad. What about e. a dog? And what Harry about a dog's and purpose? Have you? What What's about that? a dog's purpose? Have you watched that? I, I can't. I, I'll just. I'll just be sobbing. And oh, like, it's terrible. I, I, I know what's going to happen, yeah. and I. I. You know, it's it's horrible. And I'm like, why am I making yes. myself watch this again? <laughs> I love animals. I love dogs. Like anything. <laughs> That I, I'll just start crying. Yeah, yeah. What's the last thing that made you belly laugh? <laughs> uh, what was the last like thing? Like uncontrollable uh, laughing. Uh, 
I know there was one recently, but I don't recall what it was. Um, <laughs> but the, that good? Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's it's not bad. It's just it's not in my short term register, but in the <laughs> long term register. A couple of years ago, uh, we went to New York and we went to see Freestyle Love Supreme, and it's it's basically like a theater play, uh, but it's live improv hip hop kind of mixed together, and it's just so creative. It was actually uh, created by Lin Manuel Miranda uh, from Hamilton, uh, and he has this live improv troupe, freaking hilarious the whole time you're just like laughing and yeah, it was the best 90 minutes ever yeah yeah we've have, gone three times since yeah okay have you watched uh, afterlife on netflix with ricky gervais i have not after his slash life yeah it's it's yeah, fantastic yeah. it's real it's so funny but it makes you cry it's it's really? literally a tv show that will make you belly laugh and cry every episode so highly oh, wow. recommend it and lots and lots of swearing. So if you, if you don't like swearing, don't watch it. Cause um, yeah, he's, it, it made Eva swear a lot now. Um, so, <laughs> you know, goody two shoes Eva is now a big, big swearer. Okay. Well, last last make, question. Uh, Lisa think happy. Yeah. <laughs> last question. And this comes from Raya Usher, who is my, my last guest. She's my, uh, my triathlon coach and her question, you didn't listen, did you? Okay. So her question is, what is your greatest life accomplishment? My greatest life accomplishment? Well, that's a, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, I mean, right now, I will say um, I haven't, I feel as though I haven't accomplished it yet. And I'm still seeking a bigger purpose and a bigger meaning. Uh, I mean, in all honesty, like I, I, yeah. I feel as though the best is yet to come. If I go back in time, um, I don't know if it's the greatest life accomplishment, but I'm just most proud of the people that I've coached and helped mm. and mentored. And when I see people that elevate and do these bigger things, I feel just so proud yeah. that I played a tiny role in their journeys. Um, and that just makes me just happy yeah. uh, that my contribution was bigger than myself. Yeah. I know it, it, that's a really interesting thing to talk about. At the Information Lab, we've had some people leave that have gone on to just, you know, we, they didn't want to leave, but they had these incredible opportunities because of some of the things that we've helped them with. And it's one of the things like you have to celebrate when people are just accomplishing these amazing things, even if it gives you pain because you now have a hole to fill because it's so good for them that, you know, Absolutely. essentially you've promoted them out of a job with your company and that's great. Right. Yep. <laughs> so, it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I had uh, lunch yesterday with uh, Adriana Gilminer, uh, who was the former head of communications for Tableau. Uh, and she left about two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but we were talking about how so many of our marketing leaders have moved on to do incredible things. Adri's mm. now a chief marketing officer at this really hot startup in California. Uh, yeah, Lynn Gerardo is now the CMO of Vimeo. Brian Law is the CMO of Zoom Info. Uh, you've got Ellie Fields, who became a chief product officer of Sales Loft. You've mm -hmm. got uh, Ashley Kramer, who's now CPO of GitLab. Like, you look at all these people and it's like, wow they were our tribe. Like we were one yeah. and they've like, they're contributing even more broadly. That just makes me proud. Yeah. Yeah. What's your question for my next guest? Um, I don't have to type it while you say it. You have to type it. Well, I want, I need to remember it. So I need to type it. <laughs> well, I was, uh, I was like the, the question of uh, meeting a, an influential historical figure. Okay. And what would you ask them? So who would it be? And then what would you ask them? Historical figure. Okay. Who is it? And I always find that that gives you some interesting insights into uh, the individual of what, yeah. you know, where they have a connection to, but also what they would want to know. Okay. Well, great. Um, thank you very much. My uh, Everybody, please tune in next week. Next week, I am joined by the Flair Lidge Triplets. Kevin, Ken, and Keith, and I'm hoping to meet this Keith guy at some point. 
Uh, Francois, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate your friendship most of all, but also all of your great career, career guidance and advice along the way. So you're a great person. Thanks for doing what you do and keep being awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Andy. Uh, it's great that you're doing this and um, I've loved seeing you grow and expand uh, your learning and your impact uh, over the years. Great. Thank you.